Chapter Sixteen of the Second Latchkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Latchkey by Charles Norris and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter Sixteen: Why Ruthven Smith Went. Never in his life had Ruthven Smith been blessed or cursed by an anonymous letter. He did not know what to make of it or how to treat it. Instead of exciting him, as it might had he been a man of mercurial temperament, it irritated him intensely. That was the way when things out of the ordinary happened to Ruthven Smith. He resented them. He was not, and recognized the fact that he was not, the type of man to whom things ought to happen. It was only one strange streak of the artistic in his nature which made him a marvelous judge of jewels, and attracted adventurers to come near him. He was constitutionally timid. He was conventional and prim in his thoughts of life and all he desired it to give. He was a creature of a past generation, and whenever in time he had chanced to exist, he would always have lagged a generation behind. But there was that one colorful streak which somehow, as if by a mistaken creation, had shot a narrow rainbow vein through his drab soul, like a glittering opal in a gray-brown rock. He loved jewels. He had known all about them by instinct even before he knew by painstaking research. He could judge jewels and recognize them under any disguise of cutting. He could do this better than almost any one in the world, and he could do nothing else well. Therefore, it was preordained that he should find his present position with some such firm as the Van Brecks, and being in it, adventures were bound to come. Many attempts to rob him had doubtless been made. One had lately succeeded. His nerves were in a wretched state. He was jumpy by day as well as night, and sometimes, when at his worst, he even felt for five minutes at a time that he had better hand in his resignation to the firm, who had employed him for nearly twenty years, and return into private life, like a harried mouse into its hole. But that was only when he was at his very worst. Deep down within him he was aware that, while the breath of life and his inscrutable genius were together in him, he could not, would not resign. It was part of Ruthven Smith, an intimate part of him, not to be able to decide for a long time what to do when he was confronted with one of those emergencies unsuited to his temperament. He was afraid of doing the wrong thing, yet was too reserved to consult anyone. He generally counted on blundering through somehow, and so it was in the manner of the anonymous letter. He had heard, and dimly believed, that it was morally wrong, and still worse, quite bad form, to take any notice of anonymous letters. But this one must be different, it seemed to him, from any other which anybody had ever received. Duty to his employers, and duty to the one thing he really loved, was above any other duty, and for fear of losing forever an immense and unhoped-for advantage which might possibly be gained, he dared not ignore the letter. At all events, he had told himself, no matter what he might decide later, it was just as well that he had accepted the invitation to Valley House. Perhaps someone, he could not think who, was playing a stupid practical joke, with the object of getting him there. But he would risk that and go, and let his conduct shape itself according to developments. For instance, if his eyes were able to detect the small detail mysteriously mentioned in the letter, he would feel bound to act as it suggested. Yes, bound to act, but how unpleasant it would be. And the worst of the whole unpalatable affair was that if he did act in that suggested way, and if he accomplished what he might, with dreadful deafness, be supposed to accomplish, it would be the moment when perhaps he might be fooled. If the letter were written by a practical joker, he would be made to look ridiculous in the eyes of all who were in on the secret. And that brought him back to the question which over and over he asked in his mind. Who could have written the anonymous letter? It must be someone acquainted with him, or with his profession, someone who knew the Nelson Smiths and the Annesley Setons well enough to be aware that there was to be an Easter party at Valley House. The writer hinted in vague terms that he was a private detective aware of certain things, yet so placed that he could have no handling of the affair, except from a distance, and through another person. He pretended a disinterested desire to serve Ruthven Smith, and signed himself a well-wisher, 
but the nervous recipient of the advice felt that his correspondent was quite likely to be of the class opposed to detectives. What if there were some scheme for a robbery on a vast scale at the Valley House, and this letter were part of the scheme? What if the band of thieves supposed to be working lately in London should try to make him a cat's paw in bringing off their big haul? This was a terrifying idea, and more feasible than the one suggested by the anonymous writer, that Mrs. Nelson Smith should, oh, certainly it seemed the wildest nonsense. Still, there was his duty to the Van Vrecks. They must be considered ahead of everything. So Ruthven Smith, nervous as a rabbit who has lost its warren, traveled down to Devonshire on Saturday afternoon, invited to stay at Valley House till Tuesday. It was as Knight had said. The dull, deaf man was as completely out of the picture in that house party as an owl among peacocks, for he was an inarticulate person, and could not talk interestingly even on his own subject, jewels. His idea of conversation with women was discussion of the weather, contrasting that of England with that of America, or perhaps touching upon politics. He was afraid of questions about jewels, lest he should allow himself to be punked, and the information he might inadvertently give away be somehow used. But he was by birth and education a gentleman, and his relationship to Archdeacon Smith, whom everybody liked, was a passport to people's kindness. Duchesses and countesses were of no particular interest to Ruth Van Smith, but their adornments were fascinating. At Valley House one duchess and several countesses were assembled for the Easter party, and they were women whose jewels were famous. Most of these were family heirlooms, but their present owners had had the things reset, and no queen of fairyland or musical comedy could have owned more becoming or exquisitely designed tiaras, crowns, necklaces, earrings, dog collars, brooches, bracelets, and rings than these great ladies. For this reason the ladies themselves were interesting to Ruthven Smith, and he might have been equally so to them if he would have told them picturesquely all he knew about the history of their wonderful diamonds, pearls, emeralds, and rubies. It was too bad that he wouldn't, for there was not a famous jewel in England or Europe of which Ruthven Smith had not every ancient scandal in connection with it at his tongue's end. But on his tongue's end it stayed, even when, for the sake of his own pleasure if nothing else, his hosts and hostesses tried to draw him out. Nevertheless, he was not sorry that he had come. There was an element of joy in seeing, met together, and sparkling together, those exquisite historic beauties of which he had read. It had been a bother to Lady Annesley Seton and her cousin Anne to decide how Ruthven Smith should be put at table. In a way he was an outsider, the only one among the guests without a title or military rank, which mechanically indicated his place in relation to others. Besides, no woman would want to have him to scream at. Fortunately, however, there were two women asked on account of their husbands, and so, according to Connie's code, of no importance in themselves. Providence meant them to be pushed here and there like pawns on a chessboard, and they were pushed to either side of Ruthven Smith at the dinner table on Saturday night. Both had been placated by being told beforehand what a wonderful man he was, with frightfully exciting things to say, if he could tactfully be made to say them. But only one of the two had courage or spirit to rise to the occasion, a Lady Cartwright, married to Major Sir Elmer Cartwright, who was always asked to every house whenever the Duchess of Peebles was invited. Lady Cartwright was Irish, wrote plays, had a sense of humor, and was not jealous of the Duchess. Because she wrote plays, she was continually in search of material, digging it up even when it looked unpromising. "'I have heard such charming things about you,' she began. "'I beg your pardon,' said Ruthven Smith, unable to believe his ears, and because he was somewhat deaf himself, he could not gauge the inflections of his own voice. Sometimes he spoke almost in a whisper, sometimes very loudly. This time he spoke loudly, and several people, surprised at the sound rising above other sounds like spray from a flowing river, paused for an instant to listen. "'What a wonderful expert in jewels you are,' Lady Cartwright replied in a higher tone, realizing that she had a deaf man to deal with and that you have been one of the sufferers from that gang of thieves Scotland Yard can't lay its hands on. Ruthven Smith was on the point of shrinking into himself, as it was his wont if any personal topic of conversation came up, when it flashed into his mind that here was an opportunity. 
If he did not take it, so easy a one might not occur again. He braced himself for a supreme effort. Oh, yes, yes, I was robbed, he admitted. A serious loss, some fine pearls I had been buying, not for myself, but for the Van Vrecks. I seldom collect valuables for myself. I only wish these things had been mine. I should not have that sense of being an unfaithful servant, though I did my best. Of course you did, Lady Cartwright soothed him. But these thieves, if it's the same gang, as we all think, are too clever for the cleverest of us. As for the police, they seem to be nowhere. I haven't suffered yet, but each morning when I wake up, I'm astonished to find everything as usual. Not that it wouldn't seem as usual, even if the gang had paid us a visit and made a clean sweep of our poor possessions. They appear to be able to leak through keyholes, as nothing in the houses they go to is ever disturbed. Anyhow, they have latch keys, retorted Ruthven Smith, with what for him might be considered gaiety of manner. The thief or thieves who relieved me of my pearls, or rather my employer's pearls, apparently walked in as a member of the household might have done. Among those who had involuntarily suspended talk to hear what Ruthven Smith was saying about jewels and jewel thieves was Annesley. Though the party would never have been but for Knight and herself, Dick and Constance were playing host and hostess with all the outward responsibility of those parts. Lord Annesley Seton had a duchess on his right, a countess on his left. Lady Annesley Seton was fenced in by the duke and the count pertaining to these ladies. Mrs. Nelson Smith sat between two less important men, who liked the dinner provided by the American millionaire's miraculous new chef, and they could safely be neglected for a moment. Annesley felt that Ruthven Smith was, in a way, her special guest, and she was anxious that he should not be the failure Knight had prophesied. She wanted him not to regret that he had flung himself on the tender mercies of this smart house party, and almost equally she wanted his two neighbors not to be bored by him. Knight would hate that. He attached so much importance to amusing the people whom he invited. She listened and thought that Mr. Ruthven Smith and Lady Cartwright seemed to have begun well. Then, as she turned to Lady Cartwright's handsome husband, the Duchess of Peebles was talking to Dick Annesley Seton just then, she caught the word latchkey. It seized her attention. She knew they were speaking of the burglary at Mrs. Ellsworth's house. She heard Ruthven Smith go on to explain, in his high-pitched voice, that the two women servants had been suspected, but that their characters had emerged stainless from the examination. Besides, he continued, neither of them had a latch key to give to any outside person. The two women slept together in one room. At the time of the robbery there was no butler. Annesley heard no more. Suddenly the door of her spirit seemed to close. She was shut up within herself, listening to some voice there. "'What became of your latchkey?' it asked. The blood streamed to her face and made her ears tingle, as it used to do when she had been scolded by Mrs. Ellsworth. If anyone had looked at her then, it must have been to wonder what Sir Elmer Cartwright or Lord John Dormer had said to make Mrs. Nelson Smith blush so furiously. She was remembering what she had done with her latchkey. She had given it to Knight to open the front door, and so escaped from the two watchers who had followed them in a taxi to Torrington Square. She had never thought of it from that moment to this. Could it be possible that some thief had stolen the latch-key from Knight, and used it when Mrs. Ellsworth's house was robbed? Her thoughts concentrated violently upon the key. Had her neighbors spoken, she would not have heard, but they did not speak. She was free to let her thoughts run where they chose. They ran back to the first night of her meeting with Nelson Smith and her arrival with him at the house in Torrington Square. She recalled, as if it were a moment ago, putting the key into his hand, which had been warm and steady, despite the danger he was in, while hers had been trembling and cold. She said to herself that she must ask Knight, as soon as they were alone together, what he had done with the key whether he had left it in the house or flung it away. But of course he must have left it in the house, or close by, otherwise no thief would have known where it belonged. That made her feel guilty toward Ruthven Smith. She ought not to have been so utterly absorbed in her own affairs that night. She ought to have asked to have the key back, and then to have laid it where it could be found by Mrs. Ellsworth in the morning. Perhaps indirectly she was responsible for the burglary at that house. And, now she thought of it, what a queer burglary it had been. 
The thieves must certainly have known something about Mrs. Ellsworth, or else, in helping themselves to her valuables, it would not have occurred to them to scrawl a sarcastic message. That message had delighted Knight when he had heard of it. He had laughed and said, I like those chaps. They can have my money when they want it. Since then they had had his money and other possessions. If the theory of the police were right, that a gang of foreign thieves was working London, Annesley was glad that she and Knight had been robbed. It made her feel less to blame for her carelessness in the matter of that latch-key. At least she had suffered, too, and so had Knight. Could it be, she asked herself, that the watchers were somehow mixed up in the business? Were they the members of the supposed gang? That did not seem likely, for how could a man like Knight have got involved with thieves? Yet it seemed, from what he had said that night at the Savoy, and never referred to again, as if he were somehow in their power. How curiously like one of them Morello had been! She remembered thinking so, with a shock of fear. Then she had lost the feeling of resemblance, and told herself that she must have imagined it. The two faces came back to her now, and again she saw them alike. She was glad that Knight had never invited Morello to call, and glad that when grudgingly she had asked one day after the two men who had witnessed their marriage, Knight had said, "'Gone out of England. We caught them just in time.' As for the watchers, she had heard no more of them. Knight ignored the episode, or the part of it connected with those men. The memory of them was shut up in the lock-box of his past, and he never left the key lying about, as apparently he had left the key of Mrs. Ellsworth's house. Suddenly, while Annesley listened to Ruthven Smith, she became conscious that, as he talked to Lady Cartwright, his eyes had turned to her. This proves, the fancy ran through her head, that if you look at or even think of people, you attract their attention. She glanced away and at her neighbors. They were both absorbed for the moment. She need not worry lest they should find her neglectful. She took some asparagus which was offered to her and began to eat it, but she still had the impression that Ruthven Smith was looking at her. She wondered why. He can't be expecting me to scream at him across the table, she thought. Yes, he was saying to Lady Cartwright, it was a misfortune to lose those pearls. Two I had selected to make a pair of earrings can scarcely be duplicated. But none of the things stolen from me compared in value to those our agent lost on board the Monarchic. I suppose you read of that affair? Oh, yes, said Lady Cartwright, her voice raised in deference to her neighbor's deafness. It was most interesting, especially about the clairvoyant woman on board who saw a vision of the thief in her crystal, throwing things into the sea attached to a life belt with a light on it, or something of the sort, to be picked up by a yacht. One would have supposed, with that information to go on, the police might have recovered the jewels, but they didn't, and they probably never will now. I'm not sure the police pinned their faith to the clairvoyant's visions, replied Ruthven Smith, with his dry chuckle. Really? But I've understood, though the name wasn't mentioned then, I believe, that the woman was that wonderful Countess de Santiago we're so excited about. She is certainly extraordinary. Nobody seems to doubt her powers. I rather thought she might be here. Ruthven Smith showed no interest in the Countess de Santiago. Once on the subject of jewels, it was difficult to shunt him off on another at short notice. Or possibly he had something to say which he particularly wished not to leave unsaid at that stage of the conversation. The newspapers did not publish a description of the jewels stolen on the Monarchic, he went on, brushing the Countess de Santiago aside. It was thought best at the time not to give the reporters a list. To me, that seemed a mistake. Who knows, for instance, through how many hands the Melindor diamond may have passed? If some honest person, recognizing it from a description in the papers, for instance, the Melindor diamond, exclaimed Lady Cartwright, forgetting politeness in her interest, and cutting short a sentence which began dully, isn't that the wonderful blue diamond that the British Museum refused to buy three years ago, because it hadn't enough money to spend or something? Quite so, replied Ruthven Smith, adding with pride, but the Van Vrecks had enough money. They always have when a unique thing is for sale, and they are rich enough to wait for years, with their money locked up, till somebody comes along who wants the thing. That happened in the case of the Melindor Diamond. The Van Vrecks hoped to sell it to Mr. Pierpont Morgan, but he died, and it was left on their hands till this last autumn. Ah, then that lovely blue diamond was sold with the other things the Van Vreck agent lost on the Monarchic? 
was to be sold if the prospective buyer liked it. He had married a white wife, you know, and— Oh, yes, of course. It was Lady Eve Cassenden. That marriage made a big sensation among us. Horrid, I call it. But she hadn't a penny, and they say he's the richest Maharaja in India. The Melindor Diamond was once in his family, I understand, about five hundred years ago, when we first begin to get at its history, Ruthven Smith went on, ignoring the Maharaja as he had ignored the Countess de Santiago. It was then the central jewel of a crown. But later, Louis the Fourteenth, on obtaining possession of it, had it set in a ring, and surrounded with small white brilliants. It still remains in that form, or did so until it was stolen from our agent on the monarchic. What form it is in, and where it is now, only those who know can say. So strong was the call from Ruthven Smith's eyes to Annesley's eyes that she was forced to look up. She had been sure that she would meet his gaze fixed upon her, and so it was. He was staring across the table at her, with a curious expression on his long hatchet face. End of chapter 16